This episode of the Renewable Energy Smart Pod is brought to you by Deloitte. The way we power the world is changing, and Deloitte is helping leaders amplify innovation, inspire change, and illuminate a cleaner, brighter future of energy. Explore how Deloitte can help your company create a more sustainable net zero future. To learn more, click on the Deloitte links in the show notes. What's up, everyone, and welcome to the Renewable Energy Smart Pod. I'm your host, Sean McMahon, and there's no denying the topic of today's episode is indeed a very hot topic. There's been a lot of buzz about the role hydrogen stands to play in the energy transition. To help separate the signal from the noise, the law firm of Vincent & Elkins just released a paper that outlines the current low-carbon hydrogen landscape and what lies ahead as factors like the Inflation Reduction Act continue to drive growth in the sector. My guest today is Alan Alexander, a partner at V&E. Alan is going to walk us through the themes of the paper and share his thoughts on how the hydrogen sector is maturing. I got to tell you, the paper is an excellent primer on hydrogen. But what I also like about it is it includes an insightful summary of key points that developers and financiers need to remember when planning and negotiating hydrogen projects. So not only is that paper from Vincent and Elkins hot off the presses, but the Department of Energy also just released the first ever National Clean Hydrogen Strategy and Roadmap for the United States. The roadmap lays out a comprehensive framework for accelerating the production, processing, delivery, storage, and use of clean hydrogen. Much of what the DOE roadmap outlines dovetails perfectly with the Benson and Elkins paper. But just in case you listen to my conversation with Alan and wonder why we don't go into detail about the roadmap, well... That's because the roadmap was released by the DOE just as we were finishing the recording of our interview. What can I say? It's a timely topic. So whether it's coming from DOE or v &E, there's a lot of hydrogen news out there right now. Hopefully this episode will provide you with a greater understanding of what it all means. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. My guest is Alan Alexander, a partner at Vincent & Elkins. Alan, how are you doing today? Sean, I'm doing great. Thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you on here. We're here to talk about a paper that Vincent & Elkins just released. It's called Unlocking the Opportunity of Low-Carbon Hydrogen, Investment, Incentives, and Collaboration. So let's give our readers just a quick background on this. So what's the quick synopsis on the various ways that hydrogen is produced? There are a number of ways hydrogen is produced, and there's this interesting little color scheme that, you know, has proliferated and widely discussed and largely to help people talk about the ways hydrogen is produced. I find the color scheme in a number of respects to be confusing and misleading, but I don't think it's going to get dislodged anytime soon. I think some of the ones that are most talked about would be gray hydrogen, hydrogen produced the traditional way from steam methane reformers. People talk about green hydrogen, which traditionally kind of means hydrogen made in electrolyzers that are powered by renewable sources of energy, wind, solar, what have you. A lot of people like to talk about pink hydrogen, which is also hydrogen produced in electrolyzers, but the power source is nuclear fission technology, um, nuclear fission plants. There are companies out there trying to develop and prove technology that produces hydrogen using what's called methane pyrolysis, which essentially superheats natural gas and separates the nat natural gas into hydrogen and carbon, and the carbon is then emitted in a solid form as opposed to a gas. And there's blue hydrogen. A lot of people talk about that, which is essentially hydrogen produced the same way gray hydrogen is produced, but with carbon capture and sequestration technology added on. And there's a lot of other colors I have heard, yellow, gold, red, purple. I don't even know what you know a lot of them are. But I would say the ones that get talked about quite a bit in the current discussions about hydrogen are, of course, gray, blue, green, and to a little bit lesser extent, turquoise and pink. Okay. Yeah. I mean, speaking of pink, so pink is produced using nuclear, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. I saw a deal that was kind of stop and go phase from Constellation. It's kind of in the, in the headlines this week and whether they're going to make that happen. But getting back to the report. So, you know, what's the current mix of production percentages, you know, of all the hydrogen that's created by all these various processes? What are some of the most popular, I guess, or most commonly used? So 
even today, most of the hydrogen in the U.S. and the world is produced via the traditional routes. And I believe that's steam methane reformation. Um, so it would be gray hydrogen is by far and away the most prevalent in the U.S. right now. And you got to bear in mind, until about a year ago when the Inflation Reduction Act was passed, a lot of these forms of producing hydrogen, be it with carbon capture technology or via electrolysis, you know, were very interesting, but they weren't cost competitive. And, you know, we'd occasionally get a developer, you know, who'd come in and want to explore the possibilities of doing a low carbon hydrogen project, but it just wasn't, you know, they couldn't find an off taker or someone to purchase it or something to do with it because it just wasn't cost competitive to develop and produce. The Inflation Reduction Act has helped with that to a very large extent. And I believe it is going to be, you know, a factor going forward, you know, over the next 5, 10, 15 years in helping us figure out ways to produce hydrogen in low carbon means and then doing something with that hydrogen. So the mix is going to diversify. But really until a year ago, you know, the U.S. didn't have a regulatory infrastructure in place to really make it happen. And so as a result, and some of these, as we're going to talk about, are very long lead time projects to develop. So we're still looking at a mix in the U.S. that I guess is 95% or higher of traditional gray hydrogen. Okay. And now the paper also does an excellent job of kind of outlining the various use cases for hydrogen. So take our listeners through that. What are some of the most common use cases? So what a lot of people are talking about with hydrogen are not kind of the traditional ways it's used. The traditional ways it's used are, you know, in refining processes and in petrochemical production. You know, there certainly is some of that. We're seeing a lot of developers who want to develop, you know, low carbon ammonia plants, for example, and that involves producing low carbon hydrogen. But some of the really exciting uses for hydrogen and some of the things not only are people talking about, but that we're beginning to see people attempt to develop are hydrogen as a mobility solution. You know, you can right now buy a hydrogen powered car if you want to, but there is a bit of a lack of a fueling infrastructure in the United States. There's companies like Nikola who are trying to develop large trucks. There's hydrogen bus fleets. And there's initiatives, you know, and there are developers trying to figure out how to develop a hydrogen refueling network. That's one very exciting prospect for it. A number of people are looking at essentially using hydrogen as a form of energy storage. So, you know, rather than taking wind or solar, you know, that might not be able to be used at the time it's produced, you know, and essentially lost, you could use it to power electrolyzers, produce hydrogen. If you could store that hydrogen somewhere, possibly underground or somewhere else, and then release it and combust it, you know, at a time when the grid needs power, then you're essentially finding a way to do, you know, large storage projects of renewable power. Um, a number of companies are now looking at experimenting with and implementing projects to use hydrogen as a reduction agent in the production of steel. Normally, the reduction agent was just, you know, you'd have molten iron and you'd put carbon in it to essentially take out you know, some of the sticky carbon molecules, but it would emit a lot of carbon in the process. But if you can use hydrogen as that reduction agent, it lowers, you know, the carbon footprint associated with producing steel. And so a lot of people are investigating that. It's a very exciting prospect. A lot of what we're seeing right now also are what we call power to fuels projects. And they're very exciting. And I think one of the challenges hydrogen faces is that the transportation and handling and storage and distribution network for it essentially doesn't exist. And for a number of reasons, it's a difficult molecule to store and handle. But if you can take renewable power, use it to make hydrogen, and then use that hydrogen to essentially fabricate natural gas, and from there possibly make NAPFA, diesel, sustainable aviation fuel with it, then you have instantly a transportation network that already exists in the United States to handle and transport a lot of these fuels. So the power to fuel space is a place where we're seeing, you know, a lot of clients, a lot of developers, you know, really gain some traction. You know, it's a very exciting space as well. It overcomes a lot of problems that hydrogen faces. Final one is kind of near and dear to me is basically using hydrogen to make low carbon ammonia. Ammonia is kind of a base chemical and building block for a lot of other things, fertilizers, explosives, and what have you. You know, of course, in and of itself, it could also be part of the energy transition mix. There are companies looking at using ammonia as a power generation fuel itself. Um, and if you can produce that ammonia in a low carbon manner, it, you know, better for everyone. So anyway, there's a lot of uses being explored. I would say ammonia and power to fuels are the places where we've seen kind of the most traction so far. 
you know, maybe storage a little bit less and mobility a little bit less, but they're beginning to catch on. So I really appreciate that breakdown. I mean, you definitely touched on a couple of topics we've covered on this show, you know, hydrogen hubs and the storage for that way. And then also sustainable aviation fuel and things like that. But you also did mention the handling of hydrogen. And obviously, uh, <laughs> that's a concern for a lot of people. What are some of the concerns there and how are those concerns being addressed? Well, with any combustible material, people are going to be worried about safety. You know, fortunately in the United States and Europe, I think we're very good at transporting combustible materials under pressure in a way that's safe. You know, and hydrogen would certainly fit into being a combustible material. You know, there's not an extensive distribution network for hydrogen. There's one in and along the Gulf Coast of the United States to supply refineries and petrochemical facilities. Those companies, the industrial gas companies, operate with a very good safety record. Of course, if we're going to do it larger in a scale, you know, we're going to need to develop ways to basically handle, store, and transport hydrogen safely. But I'm confident that we've got the expertise to do that because we've been doing it with a lot of other flammable and combustible materials for years. Now, hydrogen is unique. It's a small molecule. It can seep out of cracks that other things can't. Everyone at some point in their life has also seen the black and white video of the Hindenburg exploding, which probably conjures up a negative association. But yeah, but, I can't, you know, I can't, that's just to jump in there real quick. Yeah, that's definitely one of the things people think about a lot. Uh, and also just in terms of the infrastructure for it. I mean, I've talked to folks in the in the energy trading landscape, and they're kind of they're, they're somewhat skeptical, like whether it's yeah. going to get built out and built out safely. So but you're confident that can happen. Well, I think your friends and your trading friends are onto something. And I think it's a point, you know, maybe we didn't mention explicitly enough in our paper, but that I state a lot. You know, I don't know that we are going to build out an extensive nationwide hydrogen transportation storage and handling infrastructure, similar to like, for example, what we have for natural gas. But we may not need to. You know, a lot of the things that we're seeing get some traction, you know, like power to fuels, for example, just get around that problem. You know, you produce the hydrogen, you turn it into natural gas, methane, and then essentially it's natural gas. You put it in that existing transportation network. Or, you know, the way hydrogen lots of times is used now, you know, it's basically produced on site or, you know, within close proximity to its final end use destination or its final end use. So, you know, I, Unlike a fossil resource like natural gas or oil, where you know it just comes out of you know, it comes out of the ground wherever geology and God decided to put it, you know hydrogen production you can you know it is produced. You can decide where you're going to produce it. You can produce it closer to your end use infrastructure if you need to. And so a lot of the projects we see actually getting traction, you know, kind of inherently understand that and just site their hydrogen production close to where it's actually going to used to the extent possible. So that, you know, is more possible in the, you know, in what we would call the blue or maybe the turquoise um, hydrogen production methodologies. You know, some of the things like electroly electrolysis that require large amounts of renewable power, the renewable power is going to be produced in West Texas or Arizona. You somehow need to either produce the hydrogen there and transport it or get the renewable power into where you're producing the hydrogen. But transporting, you know, electrons um, subject to grid capacity and constraints is, you know, also already exist. So, okay. And you mentioned electrolysis and we can't talk about electrolysis without talking about electrolyzers and, mm -hmm. you know, with all these new projects coming online, whether it's renewables or any of the sources, it seems to me there's going to be a worldwide demand for electrolyzers. Yes. What does that supply chain look like? And are, is there any kind of concern where there might not be enough of those to go around? You know, Sean, that's a really good question. I have been trying to bottom out the answer to that one for a while. And I wish, you know, I wish I could give you a definitive answer, but I've read reports that indicate, you know, production capacity is ramping up. And as projects, you know, begin to take FID, the capacity will be there. I've read reports that indicate there's going to be a huge capacity constraint on electrolyzer production because. The amount of projects that are getting announced and the amount of electrolyzers that are going to be needed are going to far outstrip, you know, production capacity before it comes online. I read other reports that indicate it's actually even worse than that because a lot of the different electrolyzer technologies use rare earth minerals that are produced in places that might be under sanctions right now, such as Russia. So I think it's murky. And, 
you know, I'm not exactly sure whether we're going to be facing a supply chain constraint as it comes to, you know, electrolyzer production capacity or not, you know, it, and it's, it's definitely something I think project developers need to be aware of and maybe need to contemplate, you know, finding an electrolyzer supplier earlier in their procurement process as opposed to later, you know, just to be on the safe side. But at least for now, it's not entirely clear to me what that supply chain picture looks like. We'll be right back. Building a brighter tomorrow starts with illuminating greater possibilities today. That's why Deloitte helps organizations weave sustainability into their business decisions. Join Deloitte in creating a brighter, cleaner tomorrow. To discover what's sustainable, renewable, and possible in the future of energy, click on the Deloitte links in the show notes. And hey, while we're talking about Deloitte, if you want to hear directly from one of their experts, check out the most recent episode of the Sustainability Smart Pod. During that episode, I chatted with John Mennell, a managing director in Deloitte's sustainability, climate, and equity practice. John walked me through some awesome tools that Deloitte has to help companies plan and execute on their decarbonization strategies. I learned a lot, so I'm going to include a link in the show notes of this episode so you can give it a listen. And now back to my conversation with Alan Alexander from Vincent and Elkins. You know, at the top of this interview, you mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act and how that's, you know, anticipated to create quite a boost for, for this sector. And so walk us through the specific points of that and just how big of an impact things like tax credits and other incentives might have for the hydrogen production industry. They're an absolute game changer. And, you know, Sean, as I mentioned earlier, a year and a half ago, when we would talk about low carbon hydrogen projects, they never really went anywhere. You know, they very quickly, at least in the United States, ran into, you know, economic realities. And those economic realities were it cost about six dollars per kilogram to produce a kilogram of green, if you will, hydrogen, you know, with like renewable power through an electrolyzer cost around a dollar to a dollar and a half to produce that same kilogram in steam methane reformer. So it was just not cost competitive, you know, at a potential three dollars per kilogram production tax credit, that math changes pretty quickly. You get a lot closer to parity. Um, and then depending on your, how, how your project is structured, you know, the renewable power generation could qualify for high, you know, investment tax credits or production tax credits. If you have standalone storage, there might be a credit associated with that. If you're doing a power to fuels project, there could potentially be the availability of a 45 Z credit for advanced biofuels, although you begin to run into anti-stacking provisions. And of course, the projects that are utilizing carbon capture could qualify for 45Q. Some of those projects can do things to potentially, depending on what treasury may or may not allow, but get the carbon intensity of their hydrogen low enough. You, know, you could have what would nominally be a blue hydrogen production project that could qualify for a production tax credit. We've seen some developers try to try to explore that route as well by doing things like supplying some of their natural gas with renewable natural gas from agricultural sectors in the Midwest, for example. So it's really exciting. And it's got a lot of people, you know, it took these projects that were on the whiteboard, but, you know, never even made it off the whiteboard into term sheets. And it's really got some things now that are in term sheets that have parties throwing real resources and developing them. There's capital being raised to support some of these things. You have the financial sector that's really looking at ways to make them work and make them bankable. So, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act was an absolute game changer as it relates to hydrogen. It has made it viable in the United States. I was going to ask you about tax credits and what's being talked about a lot is stacking up the different tax credits, right? But you, you just mentioned something in there about anti-stacking measures. So what is that all about? Well, as it relates to hydrogen, if you are producing hydrogen in what would be referred to as blue, which is utilizing carbon capture technology, and you take a 45Q credit for the permanent sequestration of carbon oxides, then that facility, um, there's a provision in the, in the Inflation Reduction Act that says no taxpayer who has taken a tax credit from a facility, you know, as a result under Section 45Q, basically for the capture and permanent sequestration of carbon oxides, they can't then change their mind later and take 45V. You know, they have to take one or the other. And if they've ever taken 45Q, they can never take 45V. And so you essentially can't stack those two credits. You've got to choose one or the other. 
And then kind of depending on what you're doing, you know, there, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act had a ton of credits available to it. Some of them, taxpayers and facilities aren't allowed to take multiple credits. So for example, I believe 45Z, I'd want to confirm with my tax colleagues, you can't take that if you're taking 45V. So it really forces you to kind of look at your project, figure out which tax credit is the most powerful for what you're trying to do and optimize around it. Now, the paper also talks about some of the hydrogen hubs that are part of the policy here in the U.S. And just explain those real quick. Like I said, we've had a couple episodes about those, but yep. what are the insights from this paper as it relates to hydrogen hubs? Yeah, what I like about the hydrogen hubs and one of the things we talk about in the paper, whereas the Inflation Reduction Act was largely a supply side impetus mechanism, you know, it's encouraging people to produce these things in the United States and using the tax code as a method to do that. What the hydrogen hubs are trying to do is, you know, stimulate and develop demand. You know, so I, I really like the hydrogen hub program because it's the government, you know, putting eight, $10 billion to work to say, okay, industry, give us some unique ideas to, as to how to use hydrogen. You know, show us who you're going to partner with, show us what you're going to do, show us how it's going to be used, what it's going to solve. And you know what? If we like your idea, we are going to give you. 800 million, a billion dollars to go out and get this done. And, and I know the old saying, whenever the government's offering you something for free, reach for your wallet, but it really is a grant. Of course, there are a few strings attached. There's a requirement to use some of the funds and community development initiatives and other things and things of that nature. But for the most part, it is a give us a good idea. And if we select you, we'll give you money to help make that happen. So it's government putting, you know, taxpayer dollars to work in a way to try to develop hydrogen demand across the country. And I've been involved with some clients on, you know, some of the hub applications. It's really kind of interesting and innovative, some of the things that our client, the people are thinking about doing to, you know, stimulate hydrogen demand and use in the United States. So I think looking forward to seeing the winners of the hub program, hopefully later this year, and then we can, then we can you know, hopefully see how that begins to develop out a hydrogen infrastructure in the U.S. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm as keen as you are to see who kind of comes out of those, uh, you know, secures those projects. Um, mm -hmm. But stepping back from the U.S. a little bit, you know, your paper talks about some of the things going on in the, in the EU uh, with the temporal mm -hmm. and geographic requirements that, that firms are going to have to be aware of and perhaps abide by. So, so what are those? Yeah, so at a 50,000 foot level, you know, as I just mentioned, what the Inflation Reduction Act has done is stimulate supply. You know, hydrogen hubs are trying to stimulate demand, but a lot of what the EU has done, you know, to kind of regulate and require the use of low carbon fuels, um, or at least some degree of low carbon fuels, are essentially demand side stimuli. So what we are seeing, you know, is are a lot of people wanting to develop projects in the U.S. to produce hydrogen or hydrogen based fuels that will then be sold in Europe or Asia or somewhere else where, you know, getting the supply side stim, getting the supply side support here to comply with the man side you know, requirements there. Um, and some of the things the EU has said in the recently promulgated delegated acts and others are that you know, okay, that's great, but if you want to get in basically a renewable fuel from a non-biogenic source into the EU, here are some of the requirements. And some of the requirements are it will only qualify if, I forget the percentage, but over an X percentage of, you know, the electricity in the region where the hydrogen project is, low car is located came from renewable fuels or nuclear from a low carbon source. You know, the other things are saying if you're using renewables, then, you know, over time, you have to be sure that, you know, the renewables you're using, you know, were produced at a time when your hydrogen electrolyzer was functioning, a concept called matching. And the issue with matching is, you know, what is the temporal requirement to it? Is it annual matching? So just as long as there was renewable power produced during the year, you can match it up with your, you know, hydrogen production in that year. Is it monthly? Is it weekly? Is it hourly in some cases? You know, and so the matching requirements with respect to when the electrical power was produced that was used to power your electrolyzer could be a bit of a constraint. I mean, you're going to have to monitor like the power that powered your electrolyzer at a, within, you know, the hour. When was it produced? You know, those matching requirements, I believe, ramp up over time. They're not required initially, but it is something that the EU has said they're going to require. The other one is the concept of additionality. 
you know, the EU does require over time, it phases in additionality requirements so that if you're going to produce hydrogen from with electrolyzers using renewable power, you have to have added renewable power capacity to the grid. Otherwise, you know, the logic being, you know, what you're doing is you're just taking renewable power from someone who would have used it anyway to power your electrolyzer. And that person who would have bought the existing renewable capacity is essentially buying non-renewable power. So it, the net effect is, is nil. So additionality requires new renewable capacity to power, you know, the new renewable demand. And like I said, these are delegated acts. I'm no European legal expert. From what I understand, you know, the commission will approve them, modify them, implement them later. You know, what they say now may not be how they're ultimately approved and implemented, but it does give us some insight as to what the EU is thinking. What it's telling developers is that's great if you want to go to the U.S. and develop a hydrogen project, but if you want to get your fuel into the EU, here's the requirements you're going to have to comply with. Okay. And so moving on to like the next section of the paper here. So... I'm just thumbing through it. Obviously, I'm not a project developer, but there are some great insights there for project developers, kind of advice on things to consider, things to remember as, as you're you know, working on putting something together. What are some of the key takeaways there? There's a number of things. This is one of the things that's really exciting, at least for a lawyer, is, um, you know, nothing we do in developing a transaction is rarely anyway you know, new and something we've never actually done before. You know, everything we do is, you know, even the new stuff is a little bit derivative. You know, and what we're doing are, is essentially producing, selling and delivering a commodity of sorts or using it to produce a commodity that then gets further sold. But all of a sudden we're doing it in a way where what we really, really care about or one of the things we really, really care about is the carbon intensity or the carbon footprint of this fuel we're producing. And so one of the things that have cropped up in documents when we're beginning to negotiate kind of low carbon hydrogen projects and, you know, low carbon fuel projects are how do you actually certify that the carbon intensity of the product as it's being produced? Because IRA does it one way, the California Air Emissions Board, Air Resources Board does it another. You know, there's all sorts of different ways to calculate carbon intensity and, you know, you're going to get differing results depending on which method you use. You know, some companies have their own way of doing it. There's third parties who will come in and kind of figure it out for you. But at the end of the day, you need to settle on a way to actually calculate the carbon intensity. And then you need to determine what that means. You know, normally when a product commodity doesn't satisfy a specification, it's considered off spec and you either return it or get a refund or something. Well, here what you have is a product that might otherwise be completely usable except if it didn't satisfy the carbon intensity requirement, you know, it's just not, it's not as carbon intense as, is it, as we were hoping it would be, but it's otherwise completely usable for the purpose it was produced. Well, what does that mean? Because beforehand, if it didn't meet a spec, it wasn't usable. Now it's usable. It just doesn't have the attribute we wanted it to have. Those attributes are also a key source of value. You know, you might produce a low carbon fuel, but who gets the right to claim the carbon accounting benefit for it? Should it be the producer? Or does the customer want the carbon accounting benefit? And how much is that benefit, the ability to claim actually the carbon reduction, how much is that worth? You know, every time you buy an airline ticket now, you see the amount of carbon associated with your flight. Well, there's people who want to be able to account for that carbon. Carbon accounting is becoming a big thing. And as we know in accounting, you can't double book. You know, some one person takes the carbon reduction and you know, one person won't. There's other attributes associated with these things sometimes, the ability to generate a biocurrency. In biogenic fuels, you know, what we have were things like RINs and LCFS credits. Well, if something similar develops for non-biogenic fuels, who has the right to claim those? And so there's this whole basket, you know, this whole bundle of sticks, if you will, of value that a lot of these products bring with them that people need to be cognizant of and be sure they don't give away in negotiations. You know, another thing that's very difficult with hydrogen and low carbon fuels is the pricing element of it. It's what's called the green premium. You know, how much more do you pay for something just because it's low carbon? You know, with traditional commodities, normally you can just look at an index and say, well, there's the price. But, you know, there's not a whole lot of indices that have developed yet to let you say how much a low carbon commodity should be. Sometimes the indices are the starting point. 
but we don't want the indice being what our you know low carbon fuel is worth because it's a value additive product. You know, it should be more than whatever the indice is, but how much and how do you calculate it? You know, so a lot of these are some of the kind of in the weeds issues we're seeing popping up. Change in law is always an issue in negotiating a contract, even more so when what's underpinning a lot of the value or governmental programs or tax incentives. I would say kind of the big takeaway, though, and the big thing, you know, I counsel clients on early on is to define what their project is. You know, it seems pretty elementary, but if you're just doing hydrogen, well, you also need renewable power. And if you're doing hydrogen, what are you doing with it? Is someone then taking it to turn it into a fuel? And very quickly, you begin to see that you have a lot of what we call project on project risk. You know, what happens if my hydrogen project is ready to go, but the renewable power facility hasn't been built yet? How do you address those issues? And what happens if I get my hydrogen facility built? but the methanation unit that's going to turn it into e-natural gas isn't ready yet. You know, and some of the, sometimes that's easy if it's one developer doing everything, even then it's complicated, but it becomes a lot more complicated if you have third parties doing these disparate parts, because you got to make sure unrelated entities are timing up their construction and operations to sync up with each other. So it's really important, I think, to early on define what you're doing, identify your partners, Make sure, you know, you're synchronizing your project to work together, minimizing project on project risk to the extent possible, you know, so that, you know, when things come online, they come online seamlessly and synchronously. So you mentioned kind of the the dangers of having third party construction and, you know, the timing not being all synced up. Do you see more projects being like that where maybe one entity is going to own the whole thing and be able to control, have a little more control over the schedules? Or will it be more common to have okay, they're building the renewable source or they're building this source and we're all kind of trying to sync up the timing. I think it's going to be in a lot of these two, at least three people. Renewable power development is a very robust and developed sector in the US, actually everywhere. And the people who know how to do that and do it well are known and defined and are very good at it. We need to let them do that. You know, that's what they're good at and probably do it cheaper than everyone. There aren't a whole lot of people out there, maybe anybody, who knows how to develop large-scale hydrogen production projects with electrolyzers. That's what people need to learn. And, you know, adjacent to that is, you know, methanation and gas to liquids. But what I see developing are, you know, is renewable power development kind of continuing to just be renewable power development. But that's where a third party basically gets retained by a hydrogen project to say, Mm -hmm. Develop me this 500 megawatt renewable power facility. I will purchase all the output from it and then we'll use that to power my hydrogen facility. And, you know, the people who know how to do that renewable development can do it and can do it well. The people who will finance it, you know, are kind of not the same people who may finance hydrogen electrolyzers and methanation and petrochemical projects. The tax equity market of the world is, you know, relatively established. You know, they know what they're doing. They know how to look at a renewables project and come in and finance it. And what we've heard is a lot of them aren't too interested in some of these new technologies yet. You know, they'd rather just stay in their lane and stick with what they know. You know, which means what you could end up having is the renewable power basically gets done by the people who know how to do it, financed by the people who are comfortable with it. While the new stuff, the hydrogen and the methanation, the gas, the liquids, everything else, is it you know, private equity? Is it commercial banks? You know, a combination of both. Maybe one of the big tax equity players decides to get into it. Direct pay and transferability of the credits also opens up other people who might want to come in and finance the, the tax credit portion of this. That's kind of an emerging area, kind of TBD, what it'll look like. So there's a lot more questions on the hydrogen and the methanation side than there are on the renewable power side. You know, I think some of the more viable ones and the ones we're seeing come in, at least for now, are the someone's doing the renewables, someone else is doing the hydrogen and the what do you do with the hydrogen? And they kind of partner up. Okay. Now, when I thumb through this paper and I kind of get a sense for what you're trying to do here, it seems like it's a excellent survey of what the hydrogen landscape looks like right now. So what is the one key takeaway you're trying to convey with this paper? Yeah. You know, the one key takeaway is hydrogen's real. You know, it's viable now in the United States. Inflation Reduction Act has had a big part of that. 
developers need to be cognizant of how hydrogen can be used. You know, what are some of the stronger use cases for it as opposed to others? And, you know, what are some of the issues we've seen developers have to grapple with so far? So we start with a very broad overview. This is hydrogen. This is all the ways it's being produced. We talk about some of the use cases. And then we kind of want people to focus on what we've seen be important in developing a hydrogen project so far so that they're cognizant of these areas and they're ready for them when they appear. And, you know, if they have any questions about how to address them or anything, we're certainly here and be happy to talk to them about it. But it's just that, you know, it's we're excited about hydrogen. We know it's got a future. Here's some of the things we've seen. Let us know if we can help. Well, hey, listen, Alan, this has been wonderful. I'm going to encourage everyone to download this paper and read it. I'll have a link to it in the show notes. I really appreciate your insights. Sean, thank you very much for having me on. Really enjoy talking about this. I mean, I'm spending a lot of time on it these days. I think there's a tremendous amount of potential here. I think hydrogen is going to be a part of the energy transition in the States. You know, it's exciting to see just how far it's come in barely a year. And, you know, it's exciting to think about where it's going to be in another year or two or three. And I can't wait to see, you know, how it unfolds and and kind of what the hydrogen economy looks like two or three years from now. Well, hey, I'm as excited as you are. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sean. Well, that's our show for today. But before we get out of here, I want to say one final thank you to the sponsor of today's episode, Deloitte. 